Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Bonnie Henry, the Provincial Health Officer for British Columbia, and this is our COVID-19 update for April 25th. I want to uh, start off by recognizing um, with gratitude that we are on the traditional and unceded territories of the uh, lekongan speaking peoples, particularly the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, and we are very grateful to be able to talk to you from these um, really special lands today. Uh, for our update today, we actually have 95 new cases of COVID-19 in the province today, bringing our total up to 1,948. Um, and I'll address a little bit in a minute where those numbers are coming from. That includes 778 in Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 853 people in the Fraser Health Region, 115 in the Vancouver Island Health Area, 160 in the Interior Health Region, and 42 people in the Northern Health Region. We have no new long-term care facility outbreaks today, and one additional outbreak has been declared over, so that we now have 11 long-term care facility outbreaks that are over. Part of the reason that we've had uh, such a dramatic jump in cases today is related to the community outbreaks that we've been investigating. As you are aware, uh, we've had an ongoing outbreak at the Mission uh, Federal Correctional Facility, um, and we've done extensive testing within that facility in the last few days. And so 40 of the additional cases are related to people who were, re who were detected at the Mission Correctional Facility, bringing up um, the number of uh, inmates who've tested positive at mission to 106 and uh, 12 staff members who are positive from the Mission Institute. In addition, you're aware that we've had two ongoing outbreaks in workplaces, including uh, superior poultry, and 16 of the new cases today are related to uh, the ongoing investigation at that facility. Um, the United Poultry uh, facility, which was uh, closed down a few days ago, remains at 35 cases positive there. And we are now up to 11 uh, positive cases that are associated with the Curl Lake uh, industrial plant in Alberta. In terms of our cases, we have 96 people who are in hospital at this point, and 41 of those people are in uh, critical care or ICU. We've had 1,137 people who are now considered fully recovered. Tragically, we continue to have deaths related to COVID-19, and we've had two additional deaths in the last day, bringing our total people who have died from COVID-19 to 100 in British Columbia. Included in the deaths, though, in the last 24 hours is our first death in one of BC's First Nations communities. Along with the many lives we have lost to COVID-19, this is a tragedy that's beyond just us. It's a tragedy for all of us. Our elders, in particular in our First Nations communities, are culture and history keepers. When they become ill and when they die, we all lose. And I want you to know that we feel that collective loss today. My thoughts are with the, her family and her entire community as I recognize the tragic impact this has on all of them. It's particularly a challenging time to not be able to come together physically in the normal way that we would to respect the customs um, that we have in communities at this time. And my condolences and my heart goes out to this community and to the family. As we continue to move forward in our COVID-19 response, it's important that we don't leave anyone behind, particularly um, people who I know are dealing with many different crises, including people who use drugs, people who are underhoused and homeless. Everyone in BC deserves to feel safe, protected, and supported through these crises. Safe physical distancing and self-isolation if you're ill can be really difficult when your housing is precarious. And this is further compounded um, for people who may also be living with mental health and substance use or addiction issues. 
we have not forgotten that we have two public health crises, two public health emergencies that we're dealing with in this province. The first of those has been going on for some time, and that is our overdose crises. And now, compounding that, is the COVID-19 outbreak. For people who are dealing with both of these challenges, daily life can be um, a very much a, a struggle. Today, the province announced uh, over uh, 1,000 hotel rooms to provide safe housing for people living in encampments in Victoria and Vancouver, and a plan, and importantly, a plan to support people in housing, but also to ensure that they have the mental health, the, the physical health, and the social supports that they need and that we need so that we can um, support people who are living with uh, mental health and substance use issues, with addictions, and with homelessness. We cannot address COVID-19 in isolation, and we need to make sure that we're supporting those people who are the most vulnerable in our communities. This action is welcome news. It reduces the immediate health and safety risks that we know were um, a challenge for people living in these encampments. And it's important for us in the health sector to be sure that we can support all of the needs of people as they are transitioned into um, more stable and important housing over the coming days, weeks, but also the months and years to come. This is not a short-term plan, and we in the health sector will be providing supports to our people and our communities going forward. I also, from the outset, have spoken about the importance of keeping safe physical distance from others and staying home when ill. These are the best and the most important things we can do to bend the COVID-19 curve. But in many cases, this has led to increased family stresses and decreased community connections. And unfortunately, for some, being at, ho being at home means not being safe. We know domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and interfamily violence can sometimes increase during crises like this one. If you are experiencing violence, it's not okay. And we want you to know that you are not alone. There are resources that are out here that we have that are available for you. If you are in immediate danger, call 911 and get the help you need. You can also call Victim Link BC. It's a toll-free, confidential, and multilingual telephone service that's available across British Columbia 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Trained support teams can give you the information and refer you for, to services that you may need. Your immediate safety is more important than physical distancing or self-isolation. And that is important for people to recognize. There is help out there for you, and we can connect you to, what, to the supports that you need. There is more information about this on the BC CDC website, but people can also, as I said, connect with Victim, Victim Link BC. You can call 1-800-563-0808 or email victimlinkbc at bc211.ca. There's also more information on the BC CDC website about how you can text or uh, send notes if you're not in a safe position to call. Please know that these supports are out there for you. We will get through this. This is a challenging time and it's becoming um, complicated for all of us. And I know people are, are tired and sometimes this can be uh, lead to, to stressors that we may not um, know how to deal with. We will get through this and we'll be stronger by taking care of our loved ones and taking care of each other. We need to continue to be kind to each other, to be calm through this crisis and to stay safe. Thank you and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. A uh, friendly reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question. Please also unmute your phones. You will not be audible until we call your name. First question today is from John Hernandez, CBC. Go ahead, John. Hi, Dr. Henry. Can you just comment on how things got so maybe out of hand at the Mission Institution because this has sort of been on the, the province's radar for a number uh, of days? Uh, and also, just given the amount of outbreaks we're seeing, you know, the outbreak at Mission Institution, poultry plants, what will it take for us to kind of manage some of these new and emerging outbreaks, get a hold on these types of things? 
Yeah, so uh, with the first one, um, from the very beginning, um, we knew it was going to be a challenge with the uh, the federal uh, correctional facility. Um, it's, a ch it's a very difficult uh, environment to effectively uh, isolate people who are ill from others, and we know that that's um, been part of the issue. Um, one of the reasons why we're seeing the increased numbers today, however, is over the last few days we have been systematically testing all of the inmates and any of the staff who are uh, have any symptoms at all. So we've been looking at if we can find people with minimal or asymptomatic uh, or minimal symptoms for the most part. And so that's uh, why we're seeing that, that big jump today. I think we are making headway in dealing with this issue. There are currently only uh, two uh, inmates who are in hospital at, the, at, this, at this time, but it is a very challenging virus and it reflects how difficult it is to, to uh, effectively isolate people who are sick within that type of an environment. And so uh, we're hopeful that uh, with these new measures, with the new infection prevention and control measures that have been put in place in this facility, that we're able to support everybody who's in the facility and make sure that uh, ongoing transmission is stopped. But we know with the, the incubation period being up to two weeks that um, it's going to take some time before we see whether that has been effective or not. With regards to the poultry outbreaks, um, you know, I, I think it really also reflects um, the fact that we have a more sensitive testing in our community. So the fact that we picked these up and that we were able to um, detect these outbreaks is a, is a good thing in a sense. Um, if they had continued to grumble along without us noticing, we would have had more broader um, transmission in the community. So that's where it's really important now for anybody who has symptoms that might be related to COVID-19 to connect with 811, to call your health care provider, um, uh, to call um, public health, to isolate yourself and um, go for an assessment and a test if it's needed. Next question is from Angela Jung, CTV. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. My question is about uh, P. PE. There's a new survey and it's found that people working in long-term care homes still feel that they don't have enough PPEs, that the supply would only last about three days. What's your response to that? Yeah, uh, you know, it is a very challenging thing. Um, as we've talked about, um, it's, a, it's a worldwide global phenomenon to try and get the appropriate protective equipment in. And yes, um, for most of our long-term care homes and many of the, uh, even the acute care wards, depending on uh, what's being used, um, we are only able to provide a, a, a three to five day supply. Um, as we get more personal protective equipment in and as we test it to ensure that it meets the standards that we need, we hope to be able to increase that. But we do, we are confident that as a province we have enough to last us for the foreseeable future, but we need to be very careful in how we measure it out to the different sectors. So that can be, I know, quite distressing for people, thinking that it might not be replenished in, in two days or three days, but I, I believe we have a good system now for ensuring that that happens and I can reassure people that we continue to get PPE in um, and that we will continue to distribute it um, in as much as we can over the next few weeks to months and, and as things stabilize we'll be able to provide um, longer term supplies for, for long term care in other settings. Next is Bethlehem Miriam, News 1130. Hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking my question. You touched on this a little bit um, with tent communities about to be cleared out. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you see happening? Um, I know it's volunteer um, until mid-May. Can you just talk about the challenges? Sure. And you know, this is this is not <laughs> this is not something that we have. This is something we have been dealing with for, for in some cases, uh, many years since the, the overdose crises really started. It's been something my office has been working with and our health authority partners have been working with, with uh, many different parts of ministries um, to try and address these issues. And right now, uh, it's a public safety concerns in the encampments that we're seeing, but it's a broader initiative from our perspective to support people who are underhoused or homeless. Um, 
um, who are dealing with many other challenging issues. And you know, from a health authority perspective on the ground, these are people we know that we've been working with for quite a long time. Um, many of them are our community. Um, they have very individual needs. There are Indigenous people who are a part of this. There are women who have specific needs. There are families who are together. So uh, that is the focus that we have in the health sector to try and support people to get into uh, a safer space for themselves where they're able to better care for themselves. But it has to be done in a way that allows those, those health and social supports to be there for people as well so that this transition is, is thoughtful and gradual and does th the best that we can to support people. Um, I realize it's going to be challenging and we're going to have to monitor things carefully and you know I've been talking um, many <laughs> well for, uh, with um, many of my colleagues uh, we've been planning for this I think it's an important step forward and, and importantly it's not just um, putting people in a place for the next couple of weeks it's about a long-term strategy that we can support people to get into supportive housing to get the supports they need long term and it's focusing right now of course on on the acute issues that are public safety issues in in Vancouver and here in Victoria but these will be initiatives to address um, the issues that we've been working on for a long time in many other communities around the province as well and uh, and for that I, I think it's a it's a really important step forward for us as a um, uh, in public health but also across uh, government to support um, people who are, are homeless or underhoused who have mental health and substance use issues and and I, I'm really I think it's a it's an important initiative that's going to lead to long-term sustained uh, support in this area and I, for that I think it's a it's I'm very grateful for that. Vaughn Palmer, Vancouver Sun. Good day, Dr. Henry. Back to mission. Um, I would note that when there was an outbreak at a provincial correctional facility, the province appears to me to have acted very quickly, capped it off. And I'm just wondering, um, is this situation at mission partly a failure on the part of the federal agency? Either they didn't know what they were dealing with early enough or they didn't take enough steps quickly enough or they didn't call on the province for help because it looks to me like there's a very different narrative between the two facilities. Well, it, it's very challenging. There's um, there's different circumstances in the facilities as well. I mean, this is a medium security facility. The, the types of accommodations and living uh, in it are, are different. Um, people are there for a longer period of time. There's a lot of turnover in our provincial correctional facilities. Um, and it is always challenging. We, you know, by the time the outbreak was recognized in uh, in mission, um, we were already behind um, in ca playing catch up around it. As we know, people can transmit um, when they have very mild symptoms, and it may not have been recognized early enough. We've had some challenges, as we've talked about in some of our uh, coordination and communication between Fraser Health and the province and uh, Correctional Services Canada. I know everybody is meaning to do their best on this, um, but being able to put in place all of the infection prevention and control measures, and, and my kudos really go to Fraser Health, who have been actively um, in the facility supporting um, the teaching and, and the importance of infection control, everything from wearing masks to enhanced cleaning and how that can be done in an effective way. So these were all things that we needed to reach our, our find um, the resources and the protocols to develop. Um, I have been in contact with my counterparts from Correctional Services Canada, from the medical side from very early on. Um, and it, it, it is sometimes a challenge when you have um, different ways of doing things and um, finding those seamless connections uh, for things like people who have been discharged or been uh, released from the facility to make sure that we're notified at, in uh, BC so that we can support people um, who were close contacts to make sure that they are isolated and they have what they need um, to take care of themselves through the incubation period. So it has been a challenging process. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, and it's a very challenging uh, thing to, to be able to support people who are in that type of a communal setting um, and to try and prevent transmission of infection. Sarah McDonald, Global News. Oh. 
Hey there, Dr. Henry. Uh, you mentioned the spike in cases at correctional institutions. Uh, we now know a fugitive who had been in a federal prison in California where we know prisoners were released early because of COVID-19 has been extradited to Canada. Can you just walk us through this process if you can? We know he was escorted back to Canada by RCMP members, we believe through YBR. So will this individual be isolated for two weeks? And if so, where? And what's the protocol here when it comes to uh, bringing home a prisoner who has to be isolated? But obviously, I'm assuming you don't want to put him in with the general population at this point coming back from California. So I don't have any knowledge of this specific uh, um, case that you're talking about, um, and you know. Uh, but I can tell you, in general, anybody who's coming into the province right now has to have a, a, an approved um, self-isolation plan, and we have facilities that we can do that effectively. So we have people who are being um, uh, isolated in uh, in hotels um, that are run by us in the province. There's also federal. Uh, um, uh, isolation f and quarantine facilities. So uh, presumably this would be fall under the federal jurisdiction and they would be, um, again, uh, they would have to, to come back to BC, um, have an appropriate isolation plan and would be quarantined and supported to be quarantined in one of our facilities. And this is something that we've been, we've put in place uh, for a couple of weeks now since the 10th of April, and it's been very effective at ensuring that everybody who's come back to um, British Columbia and um, th people like our temporary foreign workers, and we've had about a thousand of temp temporary foreign workers from Mexico who've come back to BC, or come to BC to work, and they are being, uh, um, quarantined in uh, facilities here in, in BC and and I can say that we've had at least three people who've uh, ended up being positive for COVID-19 in our quarantine facilities and they're being cared for and and that's exactly what this was designed to do so we do have processes in place and my expectation is that anybody coming into the province will uh, fit into those processes. Next question is from Kathy Smith, Fort Nelson News. Good afternoon, Dr. Henry. Um, there's been some speculation that some U.S. military personnel have not been self-isolating upon entering B.C. before actually traveling the province to get to their postings in Alaska or back to the continental U.S. for their next postings. And of course, on their journey through B.C., they use hotels and services just like any, anybody else would have to with the expense of the province. Um, and small remote communities like Fort Nelson, which happens to be on the Alaska Highway, are not equipped to handle an outbreak. So I'm wondering, can you please clarify the requirements that are specific to um, US military entering BC and how this is overseen? Uh, no, I can't. I don't know what uh, the requirements are for specifically for US military. Um, so I could get back to you on that one. I will tell you that any non-essential travel has been turned back at the border. There are many ways that people get to Alaska, not just driving through BC, um, although that may be one way. And so I don't have knowledge about uh, US military specifically. Um, we do have processes in place for any of the essential workers who are coming back and forth across the border, which include self-monitoring, having isolation when you're in uh, when you're at home so that you are not out and about in the community as we know um, and that we have uh, provisions to support people in doing that. Lisa Cordasco, CHLY. Thank you very much. Um, can you tell me how many or if there is any role being played um, in the spike that we're seeing in numbers to travel that may have occurred over the Easter weekend? Yeah, very difficult, um, but n not that we can tell. Um, most of the people that uh, are in the cases, particularly the ones we've uh, talked about today, are related to ongoing community outbreaks that we know about, um, including uh, uh, the number of outbreaks both related to the poultry plant and the correctional facilities. So I'm not aware of any increase, particularly in uh, small communities, uh, for example, the Gulf Islands or other places related to uh, the Easter weekend travel. Next question is from Brishti Basu. Victoria Buzz, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking my question. Um, can you talk about how exactly will the number of new outbreaks affect the timeline for easing restrictions? Like, is there a cutoff point or number of new cases, 
or outbreaks at which you'll consider delaying lifting some of the restrictions that were originally planned? Yeah, so um, uh, there's no exact number. It's, it's understanding what's happening in our community across the province, understanding the outbreaks that we know about and how they're evolving, making sure that we have the surveillance in place to recognize things early, both individual cases, but also anybody who is part of a cluster of a case. So those are the, the things that we've been talking about around our enhanced testing protocol now, or a change in our testing protocol, so that anybody with symptoms gets tested, that we have still surveillance for um, any respiratory illness that automatically gets tested for COVID-19 as well. And we've expanded our ability to have testing in uh, some of the more remote areas of the province. So it is um, very much dependent on us decreasing the numbers of new cases and new outbreaks. And we do consider, for example, um, the 40 cases related to mission don't change my, um, my assessment, our assessment of where we are in terms of the pandemic trajectory in BC. So we do take those things into to account. Uh, we still want to see a, a decrease in cases. We've been sort of grumbling along at a certain level for the last few weeks, which is not surprising given um, the way that we didn't have explosive growth at the beginning. So we flattened it enough that we would expect it to, to continue a little bit longer than, than some of the places where you might have a, a, a dramatic peak. Having said that, we do want to see the numbers come down. The fact that we are picking up these outbreaks is important because that tells us that our surveillance is working and that's something that's also important. Next so there is no date I can give yet. <laughs> <laughs> Next question comes from Hina Alam, Canadian Press. Hi, Dr. Henry, hope you're doing okay. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the WHO report today which says people who have recovered don't have uh, immunity. So what does this mean for herd immunity, for social distancing and reopening the economy? Uh, I, I'm, uh, it's interesting. I, I think that was um, taken a little bit out of context, Dr. Kirkoven's remarks. Um, I th what they were talking about was how we don't yet know um, whether people have immunity or how long that immunity would last. And that is, that is true, and we've said that many times. We do, however, have other respiratory viruses like SARS, like other coronaviruses that circulate that give us some idea that people probably do have immunity if we have antibodies. And that's where that testing, the antibody testing is so important, um, that we have immunity for a period of time. What that period of time is, we don't yet know. And that's where the challenge is. Um, this is such a new virus. We don't know if it's going to behave exactly like um, other coronaviruses. We've seen some differences in the behavior in terms of um, it can be transmitted uh, quite early on in illness where other, the SARS for example from 2003, we didn't see that until later on. So there's things that we don't yet know. And the part of the challenge is the antibody tests that we have. Um, there are no, many of them <laughs> out there that are, people are working on, but they have not yet been validated. So we're not sure yet about the false positives or the false negatives and what that means. So it, it is very challenging when we have something new like this to, to say anything for certain. Um, I, I think, um, given what I've read and all of the science and the papers that we've all been um, scouring over the last few weeks, that it's very likely we'll have some immunity. We don't see this virus changing as quickly as, as things like uh, influenza, for example. So I would expect that if people have antibodies, it would be protective for a period of time. But what that period of time is, I don't, know, I don't yet know, and I don't think anybody does. And, and that is what um, my understanding of what was being reflected by the WHO comments. Next question is from Lisa Houston, News 1130. Lisa? Okay, moving on, Moira Witten, Natai. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Henry. Thank you for your briefing. Um, I'm hearing healthcare workers in public, private, nonprofit facilities who say they haven't heard anything from employers or government or their unions about 
how the new staffing orders you announced about a month ago are impacting uh, their work and their pay. Um, I'm wondering if you have an update on the status of the staffing change um, and what information you could give these workers who are saying that they're still in the dark. Well, I, I can only say that there is ongoing work being done on that, um, and certainly in some areas it's already been uh, settled. It may be that um, people are not, uh, uh, they, they may have missed some communication from their unions. There's also um, a good proportion of people who aren't affected by it in that they've only worked at one facility. So it may, uh, the focus really is on people who have been working at more than one facility for the time, and it may be that uh, the job that they are doing is not one of the ones where um, there has needed to be a change in, in, uh, in the pay scale, for example. So um, it's hard to tell what uh, the initiatives or what the issues are with um, individuals, but I will say um, it definitely is progressing. Um, it's been uh, further ahead in Vancouver Coastal, as we said before. Um, Fraser Health, very complicated in the lower mainland because people work across both health authorities. So those people who um, were working in more than one facility are the ones that are going to see the, the changes and be affected by this uh, most and earliest. Um, but I do fully expect everybody will uh, have a better understanding um, as, the, as the weeks go by. Next question is from Leslie Evans Ogden. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Dr. Henry, for speaking with us today. Um, you've repeatedly advised British Columbians while socially distancing to take care of mental health by getting out into the outdoors for exercise, but provincial parks across the province have been closed, and even places like Pacific Rim National Park with miles and miles of open beaches, seemingly ideal for physical distancing, are closed too. This potentially funnels higher concentrations of people into narrow, linear trails in city and regional parks that do remain open, is there a plan for conversation and better coordination between parks and public health to allow for safe use of parks for safe outdoor exercise? Uh, absolutely, and I think there's a number of reasons, as I've mentioned before, why uh, provincial parks were closed. Um, part of it has to do with, um, you know, social distancing and the concerns about use of facilities and parks. But really, uh, a lot of it has as well to do with our forest fire risk and the flooding risk that we're seeing now, which has started in this season, and being able to balance um, the need to respond to those many different uh, concerns around uh, parks. And as you say uh, it, it's it, it's not done on a park by park basis having said that uh, yes we are looking at how we can um, open up the parks in a safe way as we start to transition to our new normal um, and we're also uh, talking with uh, the federal government around federal parks and how they um, can be managed in a safe way uh, for the future as well so we have time for one more question this afternoon for any reporters that didn't get to ask a question, there will be a statement released later this afternoon. For recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the provincial health officer's orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. Last question is from Chad Pawson, CBC. Go ahead, Chad. Yeah, hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about any uh, COVID-19 wards and hospitals that are looking at transitioning at this time so that elective surgeries can restart? Yeah, so we're, we're looking at it in a whole system um, way. There are still, uh, um, particularly the intensive care units in, in a number of hospitals have uh, uh, numbers of cases in them, but we're looking at uh, transitions because when, when, you, when you start elective surgeries, you have to use the post-anesthetic recovery rooms and the operating rooms, which were all part of our um, strategy for surge capacity should we need it in intensive care. So how to ramp those up in a way that is thoughtful and, and um, systematic is uh, the work that uh, others are doing, including uh, Michael Marchbank, as you've heard about. Um, so yes, th those are part of the strategies we're looking at. How do we um, have uh, sep separate spaces for uh, COVID-19, both critical care spaces and, and regular hospital beds and wards, and be able to um, essentially have those cohorted so that um, everything else in the hospital can 
go on as well. We're also talking about, you know, the strategies about reducing the numbers of hospitals that take COVID patients as the numbers decrease so that uh, you can ramp up more fully in other facilities. Recognizing, of course, that we are not yet out of the woods entirely and we can still see um, explosive outbreaks that are happening in our community. And, you know, we've been relatively lucky in that we've caught uh, some of these early, but we can't let go, low, let go our guard yet. We see in Alberta, we've seen in, in uh, Ontario as well, that these can become very large very quickly. So we need to uh, we need to hold the line right now, but those are all the planning that is going in uh, to our reopening, um, particularly healthcare services, really important, and diagnostic services that have been put on hold. And we'll be um, spending more time talking about that uh, next week. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.